What is up, everybody? Welcome into the Two Stripes podcast, the college football podcast that somehow got a tweet from a player's dad the other day that was upset that we didn't talk about him. That was kind of interesting since deleted, but uh, really enjoyed that. Hope you all are having a very good week. My name is Colton Denning, and I am coming to you from Boulder, Colorado on April 19th, 2017. Beautiful day here. You're probably listening to this on Thursday the 20th. want to thank you all for tuning into the Two Stripes podcast and have a fun show coming up today. After talking UCLA early in the week, I am sticking in the Pac-12, but moving to the Pac-12 North to talk Washington Huskies football with Ryan Priest of UWDogPound.com. And there's a hell of a lot of stuff to get to when it comes to Washington football in 2017. Washington, of course, coming off of the playoff appearance last season, winning the Pac-12, demolishing Oregon, demolishing Stanford, and kind of jumping up on everybody's radar. It seems like we all thought that they would have a good season. The schedule kind of set up for them to have a good year, but Washington really ran through that schedule with the exception of USC on their way to a Pac-12 North championship, Pac-12 championship, and then the playoff appearance before losing to Alabama in the Peach Bowl. But very good season for the Huskies and a lot of interesting things to get to when it comes to them in 2017. So I'm going to spare you guys my usual pre-ramble before we get to the interview and dive straight into it. Let's talk some Washington Huskies football with Ryan Priest of UW Dog Pound. So, to talk everything about University of Washington football, I am joined by one of the co-managers of UW Dog Pound, Ryan Priest. Ryan, how are you doing today, my friend? Thank you for joining the show. I'm doing great. Thanks for having me on. Really appreciate it. Yeah, so I, I feel like last year was probably a bit of a whirlwind for Huskies fans and maybe not the way that it ended with the loss to Alabama, but there was a really there was a lot of really great stuff at the beginning of the season and, and through the regular season. So let, let's take a trip back to the beginning of last season. What were some of the expectations for this team? And, you know, when when did it kind of start to sink into everybody? Like, wow, this this is a thing that could be really special. Well, I got to say, uh, just and, you know, this is just my point of view, so maybe it doesn't mesh with everybody, but my sense of where most Huskies fans stood at the beginning of 2016, you know, in, in late August, early September, was everybody was, was thinking like a 9-3, and 10-2 and two campaign in the regular season was definitely doable uh, and definitely possible. Um, you know, if you, if you look historically at the way great coaches have performed in their first three years, most of them have really hit their stride in year three. And uh, 2016 was year number three for Chris Peterson, who Husky fans have uh, pinned a lot of hopes on ever since uh, snagging him from Boise State um, part of the 2014 season. So optimism was high, but uh, the recent history of, of, of Washington has, has been something less than stellar. So uh, a lot of people still felt a little bit snake bitten. Uh, you know, there's definitely some, some cautious optimism, I guess, is the best way to say it. You know, you, you, you saw in, in the early season – with the weak non-conference, you know, they, they looked great, but the quality of, of opponent was so low that it, it was hard to know what to take away from that. But then when you saw the Huskies dismantle a, you know, a, a top 10 opponent at Stanford, uh, in Stanford at home uh, on national TV, that, that was really when things kicked into gear and, and people started to think that the uh, college football playoff it was actually a legitimate possibility. So looking at Chris Peterson heading into his fourth season, what has he brought to that program that maybe a guy like Steve Sarkeesian or some of the recent previous UW coaches haven't brought in? Not to bury any of those guys, but what do you think he brings that's different to that program that Washington hasn't seen recently? You know, if I had to sum it up in one word, it would be consistency especially under Steve Sarkeesian, um, him being a first-time head coach and all, you, you really saw these wild fluctuations during the Steve Sarkeesian years where the Huskies would go out and beat, you know, number three USC uh, in, in Pete Carroll's final season in, uh, in 2009 when the Huskies were coming off an 0-12 campaign. And, you know, you'd have these really high moments like that. And then you would also have these these times when they would just stumble and fall flat on their faces. And, 
give up 450 rushing yards to uh, to Andrew Luck in the in the Stanford Cardinal. So the, they were just these wild swings. Uh, the Huskies were abysmal as a road team um, under Steve Sarkeesian. Under Chris Peterson, that has all changed. What what we're seeing from his teams are very consistent products, week in and week out, home away, whatever the situation is. You know what you're going to get from a Chris Peterson coach team. And that's something that the Huskies honestly haven't seen since the days of Don James. So last thing on the 2016 season before moving to this year's squad, you mentioned the big win against Stanford. And the one that stood out for me was the win over Oregon. They beat him 70 to 21. First win over Oregon for Washington since 2003. I remember seeing before the game a bunch of Oregon fans posting memes of I think like the main one that I remember was Washington hasn't beaten Oregon since Facebook started (laughs) and all this different stuff of shit talking from Oregon fans to Washington fans. And of course, Washington goes and just absolutely beats the hell out of them on the road. How big of a mental hurdle do you think it was for that group and for the program to get over that hump and beat Oregon and then finally kind of assert themselves on top of the Pac-12, if at all. Well, it's it's funny. If you go and look at some of the interviews that the players and the coaches did like in the week leading up to the Oregon game, Chris Peterson is very uh, well known for message discipline among his players. So all the quotations you see from stories in, in the week leading up to that game are, you know, this is just another game. It's another faceless opponent. We're just there to play 60 minutes and, you know, and win. Really echoing kind of ironically uh, Oregon's win the day mentality under uh, Chip Kelly. And then you see them knock them off 70 to 21. Uh, Jake Browning has that very famous picture of him pointing at an Oregon D end uh, as he's rushing into the uh, end zone. And fun fact, uh, he he actually got punished for 500 push-ups by Chris Peterson for that little taunt that cost him 15 yards. And uh, after doing those push-ups, uh, Jake Browning just wrote on Twitter, simply, worth it. Um, <laughs> but you, you saw them just put up this huge victory. And then after the game, after the week in which they said, you know, it's just another game, it doesn't mean anything, after they posted that big win, all the players who were quoted in, in game stories after that were talking about how much they knew they meant, or how much they knew this meant for the fan base, and and what it was to to get that monkey off their back. So you you really can't point to a game more important for for them to to win that season. E- even looking at you know the Sanford game where the the national import of that was going to be more important than Oregon, who had taken a step back, obviously. But the the Washington Oregon rivalry is one of the fiercest, if not the fiercest, in the Pac-12, and th- and that's not known to a lot of people outside of the West Coast. But it's the the, the hard feelings between the fan bases are, are definitely present all the time. So that just made it that much sweet to to drop a seventy burger on your uh, on your arch enemy. One of my favorite things to watch last year for them was that defense. They were flying around, they were attacking, and especially that secondary group. But now, three big losses in Buda Baker, Sidney Jones, and Kevin King. A, a ton of production, 128 tackles, 16 tackles for loss, 7 interceptions, 25 passes broken up, and 3 forced fumbles, all gone. Where does Washington move from here in 2017? I know they got a couple of pieces back and a couple of younger guys that are ready to step up and make that jump. But who might that be? Who's going to step up for those guys? And how big of a step back do you think that they will take in the back end this year? Well, before pointing out any individual players, it's interesting that this situation is a little bit reminiscent of uh, what Washington was looking at going into the 2015 season. In, In the 2015 NFL draft, they lost four of the top 44 picks in the draft from their defense in Shaq Thompson, uh, Haole Kikaha, and uh, a, a couple other guys, and uh, Marcus Peters being one of them, and the, the fourth one I'm totally forgetting off the top of my head. But anyway, you, you had these uh, this, this huge dearth of, of talent coming off that side of the ball, and, you, and just the, the worry was how, how on earth is Chris Peterson and Pete Kwiatkowski, the defensive coordinator, how are they going to make up for this loss? And they responded by being statistically better in 2015. So it's interesting. It'll be interesting in 2017 and definitely one of the key storylines to follow for, uh, for Husky fans 
is can they replicate that result from 2015? Now, in terms of who's going to step up to, to replace those players, you know, in, anytime you lose both your starting cornerbacks who are legitimate first-round talents, you have to think that it's going to be an uphill battle, battle to, to be even better the next year. But the Huskies have been very good at stocking talent there, and, and that's a total credit to defensive backs coach uh, Jimmy Lake. He has done more than earn his paycheck over the last couple of years, and uh, he, he was somebody who, that was targeted by several different programs in the uh, offseason following the end of last season. And most Husky fans were, were pretty um, confident that he would end up as a full-time defensive coordinator at another Power 5 program as opposed to a co-defensive coordinator at Washington. So they were pretty ecstatic to see him come back. But in terms of specifics, the number two players on the depth chart last year uh, at the end of the season were kids named Jordan Miller and Austin Joyner. Um, Austin Joyner is a really, really talented recruit who's just had a lot of trouble staying healthy. Um, just one, one of those uh, guys that's unfortunately, you know, it's athletic potentials, you know, the, the sky's the limit, but he just can't ever seem to, to, uh, you know, string string together a full 13 weeks of uh, of health during the regular season. Um, Jordan Miller is somebody that is uh, honestly going to be regarded uh, by Husky fans as the the next Marcus Peters. Um, he's a really high ceiling guy. wasn't forced into action too early. The and and the Huskies are definitely in the position where they're reloading as as opposed to rebuilding. In terms of uh, other names to look out for there. Chris Peterson's highest ever recruit uh, that he brought in came in the 2016 class. Uh, he's a cornerback out of Arizona named Byron Murphy. And because of the depth they had at the position this year, they were able to, to stuff him in the weight room and, and have him redshirt a season. So he is definitely a breakout candidate for this coming season. He's been a name that's popped up a lot in the, uh, in the beat rider reports from, uh, from spring ball so far. So it would not surprise me at all to see him latch on to a uh, starting position by year's end. One of the things that Washington's defense was awesome at, um, among many last season, was causing havoc. They finished the season ranked 12th in linebacker havoc rate, 9th in defensive back havoc rate, and then 5th in adjusted sack rate. And I want to get your thoughts on the philosophy of what Chris Peterson does on defense. And we talk, we just talked about those defensive backs gone and with the linebackers too two guys in particular stand out that have now left for the NFL and saw Mooching and Joe Mathis two of their better pass rushers do you think that Washington's defensive philosophy of attack 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 whether that's ball in the air going after forced fumbles trying to cause fumbles and getting after the quarterback is going to change or are all those new faces kind of recruited as pieces to basically do the same thing where this is the philosophy of that defense it's going to be attack 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 no matter who's in there well there's, there's no question that attack 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 is what Pete Kwiatkowski wants to do uh, the question is does he have the talent on the back end to actually make that happen in 2016 with players like Buda Baker Sidney Jones and Kevin King and Jojo McIntosh patrolling uh, the secondary um, they were in a position to be able to to, to do that and even better what you saw early in the season was Washington got consistent pressure on opposing quarterbacks with four pass rushers. And, uh, and that, that changed, unfortunately, when Joe Mathis, uh, their, their buck linebacker, who's uh, kind of a, a hybrid defensive end outside linebacker position, uh, when he went down for, to, to end the year with an injury, and then uh, when Azeem Victor went down in the USC game uh, with a season-ending end, injury of his own, uh, they they certainly had to uh, adjust their their plans a little bit in terms of how they did that. But there, there's no doubt that Peterson and Kwiatkowski's philosophy is get pressure up front with with your top four. Let your let your four secondary starters patrol the backfield and just let everybody in the middle cause havoc. And uh, they they had a fantastic roster for that last year, and they're they're gonna want to do that again this year. Um, but it's one of those things that until you actually see them do it on the field, you know, you you got to prove it and before you can uh, actually believe it's gonna happen. So shifting gears to the offense, quarterback Jake Browning was fairly awesome in his sophomore year, throwing 43 touchdowns, nine interceptions. They had a very good passing game, but the last five games kind of cooled down a little bit. 
Browning only completed 54% of his passes, barely over 6.5 yards per attempt, and then a 9-5 to touchdown interception ratio. And there were some very good defenses and secondaries when you factor in Alabama and Colorado in that last stretch. But what does Jake Browning need to do to take that next step? Because it seems like he, he obviously took the step from his freshman year to one of the better quarterbacks in the country in 2016. But where do you think that development goes in 2017 for him to be maybe a top five quarterback in all of college football? Well, just pointing toward the end of the season, that little drop off he had, it'll be interesting to see which factor was more important than that. A, was it the improved defenses in terms of, you know, Colorado's secondary, which was awesome last year, and Alabama, which speaks for itself? Was it the effect of facing them? Or was it the effect of a shoulder injury that he suffered in, I believe it was the Arizona State game? He had minor uh, sh shoulder surgery at the end of the season to clean that up. And um, he, he's being held back a little bit in spring ball, but I, I get the feeling it's more because they already know what he brings to the table and they just want to make sure he's 100%. You know, they, they don't need to win spring ball with him. I'm, I'm very interested to see if he's able to come back healthy and what's he going to look like? Is, is he going to look like that first half quarterback or is he going to look like the second half quarterback that, that struggled a little bit more? In terms of what he needs to do going forward, he's, he's got to find a replacement for John Ross, which, as, as we all know, finding a replacement for a guy who runs a 4.22 uh, second 40-yard dash is not exactly uh, easy to do off, off, the, uh, off the cuff. But he has some really talented uh, receiver options to do that, even if they're not going to be – the replacements are going to be quite as talented as, as John Ross is. Having Dante Pettis come back is going to be key. Having somebody like Chico McClatcher step up as a junior is going to be important. And he's also got a couple of talented freshmen coming in that are almost certainly going to see the field from day one. In particular, uh, the Huskies have a uh, true freshman recruit coming in named Ty Jones, who enrolled in time for spring ball this year that should help him get a jump on it. He's a, he's a six foot four prospect. You know, the, the Huskies really were lacking anybody with that kind of size last year. You know, they, most of their receivers were anywhere from the five ten to six one range. So having somebody with that six four leaping ability and, and reach is uh, going to be a pretty key weapon going forward. That's interesting you bring that up because the one thing that I hear about Jake Browning from people, and maybe this is more so. NFL draft draft types as well he doesn't have a huge arm but they were able to create some explosive plays with John Ross but now that there's a bigger guy like Ty Jones and this isn't just a question for 2017 but moving forward too is do you think that passing game is going to move towards more you know of a, an efficiency based especially with a guy that's 6'4 and then you add in to players like Chico McClatcher and then Dante Pettis as well? Yeah, I mean, if efficiency is the name of the game with Chris Peterson. He loves nothing more than, a, you know, a, a third and two situation. He, he will do that all day, every day, especially with running backs like uh, Miles Gaskin and LeVon Coleman. Having a one-two punch like that on the ground is important. In, in terms of what he wants to do going forward, yeah, getting into positions where he can just consistently – move the ball on, on first and second down to, to get manageable thirds. That That's how he wants to live. And that's how the Huskies were able to find a lot of success in their breakout season in 2016. Well, let's talk about Miles Gaskin. That dude is a goddamn hoss. <laughs> he is a monster. And what are his expectations for 2017? He had a huge year last year. And now that Ross is gone and may, maybe the passing game is going to get off to a slower start, how much of the load do you think he's going to shoulder early on for that offense? And, and what do you expect from him in 2017? You know, it, it's interesting. As as a true freshman in 2015, uh, he very quickly became Washington's, you know, number one bell cow running back. And he, he started the season that way, too. But you really also saw the emergence of LeVon Coleman. Coleman came in as a four-star guy, really talented recruit. But it took him a couple years to get it going. And, and last year was really his breakout season. So, And I think what you saw was as he showed his ability and to, to you know, not have a drop off from Gaskin to him, that gave Gaskin the ability to take, you know, five or seven fewer carries a game, stay that much fresher in the fourth quarter. And uh, that, that's where you saw a lot of uh, success in games during the season's end when Washington's athleticism would just assert itself 
toward the end of the game, you'd, you'd see their offensive line consistently getting pushed. You know, runs that would go for two yards in, in the first quarter were going for, for five in the fourth. And they certainly bring back enough people on the offensive line as well as at the running back positions to, to think that's a realistic expectation for this coming season as well. Before we get to 2017 expectations, what do people feel about new wide receivers coach Matt Lubick? He's bounced around a, a lot this offseason, but he comes in highly regarded and gets to work with this new receiver group. What's the, the feeling been about that hire? Uh, you know, it's it's one of those things that, that the proof is in the pudding, and uh, if they have good returns, I'm, I'm sure that Husky fans will be uh, more than pleased to keep him on. H Husky fans have been pretty fickle toward the offense, uh, especially in terms of uh, offensive coordinator Jonathan Smith, who th this is his first Power 5 job, and his first two years uh, in the position were not the most stellar for Washington's offense. As you can imagine, we, we heard a, a lot of calls for his job in, in the first two years. Not really anything like that following last year, which is what happens when you turn in the kind of offensive performance that he did. Um, it's funny how that works. Um, <laughs> but uh, go, going forward, um, just replacing Bush Hamden is, is going to be tricky, to say the least, both as an on-field coach and as a recruiter. And I, I simply don't know enough about him to say whether or not he's up for the job. But Washington fans certainly give Chris Peterson the benefit of the doubt in these situations. And he, even even if the Huskies uh, receivers take a step back next year, um, he, he's, he's going to have at least a couple of years to, to get it done, you know, as so, so long as he retains Chris Peterson's blessing. So looking at 2017 in the schedule, I hadn't looked at it until last night. And one of the things that I really like for them is how it sets up because first seven weeks at Rutgers, Montana at home, Fresno state at home at Colorado, at Oregon state, Cal at ASU, and then a bye week And I know last year, like kind of the, the fun thing to do before the playoff committee released their final rankings was throw shade at Washington for the non-conference schedule they played and for the Pac-12 and teams like Oregon being down and I, I don't think it's shade to say that this is a, a very manageable and easy starting schedule for them to, to begin this year. And especially with a new defense, it's going to give them time to gel and kind of get ready. And I, I think the offense should be able to handle most of these opponents. How do you think this schedule shakes out? And where, where do you think they're, they're going to end up at the end of the 2017 season? Well, I mean, as you mentioned in 2016, we – the only thing we ever heard <laughs> during discussion about, you know, uh, the the playoff berths in, in the weeks leading up to the selection committee's announcement was how wa was how weak Washington's non-conference was. And 2017, in that respect, is going to be a Groundhog Day effect. Uh, you know, you're again playing Rutgers this time uh, in New Jersey. Uh, you've got Montana at home, and you've got Fresno State at home. Uh, not exactly a lineup of world beaters there. Part, part of that is uh, the fact that the schedule was created when Washington was a perennial 500 team. They didn't expect to <laughs> kind of make this leap so early. And I think that's why you saw the aggressive scheduling for years going forward, uh, such as last year when they announced that uh, the Huskies will play uh, Auburn in the Chick-fil-A uh, kickoff game in a couple of years. But in, in terms of where the pitfalls of the, uh, of the schedule lie, I, I, I think you're going to see fairly smooth sailing through that bye week, as, as you mentioned. Colorado, uh, despite being the, the Pac-12 South uh, defending champion, is certainly going to take some, some steps back. Uh, Oregon State isn't particularly scary. You know, Cal brings in a new coach. And uh, Arizona State is the one that spooks me a little bit just because things always seem to go crazy for the Huskies anytime they travel to the desert. Uh, you know, last year they were taken into overtime by woeful Arizona. <laughs> so so who knows what's going to happen. Um, but but that stretch of uh, UCLA, if, if they're still carrying a, a healthy Josh Rosen and then uh, Oregon and Stanford back to back. I, I don't know what it is about the Pac-12 uh, scheduling office, but the Huskies seem to play Oregon and Stanford back to back every single year. Um, I think they've played the two of those teams back to back like seven out of the last nine years or something like that. Which you know maybe it's not as scary this year, but you know in in the uh, in recent history, you know under Chip Kelly and then you know Jim Harbaugh and uh, David Shaw, that that certainly was not never a fun two weeks for for Husky fans. So you know if if they get through that stretch three and zero, I I think you got to call that a, a successful season. E even even two and one would be uh, you know 
Husky fans wouldn't like that after after uh, going two and zero against uh, Oregon and Stanford last year. They they missed uh, UCLA in the uh, cross division opponents, but. Uh, if, if they're able to come out of that unscathed, I, I think Husky fans are going to breathe a real big sigh of relief. Looking at the program overall and from the outside in, from my perspective, this definitely seems like the best place that Washington football has been in, at least in the modern era. And let's say they go 10-2 and two or 11-1, and one, even 9-3 and three again. What do you think after last year and then coupled with if they do that this year, what do you think can be the expectation – for Washington and Chris Peterson going forward? Is it a playoff appearance every three years? Is it once every five years? What do you think fans are expecting from the program if they have an, another really good season? I, th- I think the baseline for success for Washington going forward in terms of you know fans feeling good is Rose Bowl contention every November. If they are in the thick of the race uh, for to, to be in the granddaddy, um, that's going to make most Husky fans pretty happy. Uh, you know, I, I think most Washington fans are realistic enough about where the Huskies fall in recruiting rankings to know that they're not going to be a college football playoff contender every single year. While the Huskies are, are good and they bring in good talent and they have some of the best coaching in, in America with Chris Peterson at the helm, I think there's also a realistic acknowledgement that they're not Ohio State, they're not Texas, they're not Alabama. So there, I don't think you're going to see a situation where, you know, the Huskies miss the college football playoff two years in a row and, you know, fans start to get restless. That's just not how things work up there. Seattle's not bad recruiting territory, but neither is it uh, Southern California. So as long as they're in the conversation for the college football playoff and the Rose Bowl deep into the season, I, I think – most fans are going to be pretty happy with that, especially if that translates into, you know, a, a Rose Bowl or, or playoff berth every every couple of years. Final one, and we'll get you out of here. That first weekend in December, is Washington playing for the Pac-12 championship again? You know, I, I got to think they are. Stanford is, is going to be a, uh, a tough opponent in, in terms of the Pac-12 North race. And you, you got to think Oregon is going to take a step forward just because, you know, with the return of Royce Freeman, and, uh, you know, kind of the, the new blood coming in with uh, Willie Taggart as head coach and Jim Levitt as uh, the highest paid defensive coordinator in the Pac-12 coming from Colorado. If, if they're able to, re- to improve that defense to, to be mediocre as opposed to abysmal, which is what they were last year, Oregon certainly has the talent on their team to, to make a run toward that, even though uh, the Oregon-Washington game is in uh, Seattle. I, I don't think anybody's considering that game a gimme. That's just not how Washington fans ever approach Oregon, especially after the last 13 years. So it, I, I think much as, as it's been in recent history, the, the road to the uh, to the Pac-12 North Championship and, and the Pac-12 Championship overall is going to go through Washington, Oregon, and Stanford. Well, if you want to follow any of Washington's road to the Pac-12 championship, you can do so by going to uwdogpound.com and following them on Twitter at UW on SBN. You can also find all of Ryan's work on Twitter at Ryan Priest and on uwdogpound.com. Ryan, thank you for joining the show. I really appreciate it. Yeah, thanks for having me on. I also just want to point out that I realize I am going to get relentlessly flamed by USC fans for not saying that the uh, road to the title goes through L.A., so my apologies. Well, you know you know what? <laughs> I, and I, I talked USC last week. You know, I, I think that the easy bet is that USC is going to do it, but how many times in the last five years has USC been the easy bet? And maybe that's not fair, to this current group of players and to Clay Helton and a different coaching staff. But it it does seem like whenever those expectations have been placed on USC, that that's kind of where things have gone south. And and maybe this year's different, but I think USC's kind of at a a, a show-me type of status for their program to, yeah, maybe you guys are good enough, but... You should probably do it first before everybody anoints you. But it certainly seems like they have the talent to do it. Well, the national media loves nothing quite like a USC as backstory. And you know what they say about broken clocks. At some point, you're going to be right. <laughs> yeah, you would think so. You know, obviously, Sam, Sam Darnold's like the greatest quarterback of all time <laughs> heading into the 2017 season. So we'll see. But Ryan, thanks again for joining the show. I appreciate it. And hopefully we can talk again 
later in the season and laugh about USC being eight and four. <laughs> How about four and eight? Yes, I'm fine with that as well. Our, our new Notre Dame. <laughs> All right. Take care, Colton. Thanks for having me. and eight USC is something I completely endorse and probably something that this country needs right now. We're all looking for stuff to bring us together. And I think a four and eight USC would do that. That's just me though. (laughs) Thanks to uh, Ryan Priest for joining the show. Make sure to follow him on Twitter at Ryan Priest and read all of his work at uwdogpound.com and then on Twitter as well at UW on SBN. Very excited to watch the Huskies this year. And as I do these episodes, I probably sound like a broken record because I say that about every single one of these teams. Like, oh, it it should be interesting to see what they do this year. But at least for me, I I think every single one of these programs has an interesting story. And for whatever reason, whether they're losing players or returning a lot of players, whether they're going to be a playoff contender or whether they're looking to not go 3-9 and this season, I, I think that each one of these teams and the teams that we'll preview for the rest of the offseason have a unique story and there really isn't any college football team out there that that I think doesn't have a story that's worth being told heading into the 2017 season unless you're like Iowa Rutgers or Northwestern like I, I don't want to hear any anything about either of those three programs those That can stay far the hell away from me. Like even a place like Illinois, I think, has an interesting storyline with Lovey Smith in his second season. But if you're Iowa, Rutgers, Northwestern, like I I don't want to hear anything about your program. But everybody else, a lot of cool stuff going on. So I'm going to be very interested in seeing the Huskies this year. We'll definitely check them out when they come to Folsom and play CU as of right now. Don't think that'll go well for the Buffs, but going to be rooting very hard for CU to extract some revenge on what the Huskies did to them in the Pac-12 title game last season. That's pretty much going to wrap up this episode, though. Want to thank you for listening. Want to thank Ryan Priest for joining and talking Washington football. And of course, if you want to listen to any episode of the Two Stripes podcast, there are two ways that you can do that. One, you can go to soundcloud.com slash two stripes pod. Every episode is available there in the archive. And then you can go on iTunes as well. Search Two Stripes Podcast. You'll find every episode there too. And if you like the podcast, please subscribe, leave a review, leave feedback, leave a star rating. Any feedback to help me make this show better is greatly appreciated and something that I want. I want to hear from you and hear what you like about the show, hear what you don't like about the show. I say it every week, and I don't mean to sound like a broken record, but that shit really helps. So if you like the show, please leave feedback, subscribe, anything I can do to make this show better. You can also follow me on Twitter if you want, if you like pro wrestling gifts. If you like pro wrestling at all, I would highly encourage you to do that. If you don't like pro wrestling, I would not follow me on Twitter. But if you're interested, the name's at Dubsco. That's D-U-B-S-C-O. You can find me there on Twitter. You can also find my work on LandGrantHolyLand.com and at LandGrant33, talking everything Ohio State athletics. That's going to do it for this week's Two Stripes podcast. My name is Colton Denning. Thank you for listening, and I'll talk to you next time.